this is William Lane Craig. At its annual meeting in Dallas-Fort Worth last year, the Evangelical Theological Society hosted an Author Meets Critics session devoted to the discussion of my recent book, In Quest of the Historical Adam. The panel featured Hans Madueme, a New Testament scholar, John Collins, an Old Testament scholar, Michael Murray, a Christian philosopher, and Leia Lusco, who is a paleoanthropologist. After the four panelists presented their responses to my book, it was my turn to respond in turn to their comments. Well, I'm grateful for all of the time and effort that our commentators have obviously put into their papers. Faced with such a plethora of detailed comments, I don't want us to lose the forest for the trees. So what I want to do is take a step back and look at the big picture, and I'll need the lights uh, in order to <laughs> see my notes. <laughs> and then review the comments in light of the case that I present. It's important to understand my target in this book. My aim is to refute the claim of secularists and revisionists that the existence of Adam and Eve is incompatible with the evidence of contemporary science. My argument has two parts. One, hermeneutical, steps one to 10, and one scientific, steps 11 to 18. In the first part, I want to determine, independent of modern science, what our biblical commitments are. By biblical commitments, I mean what the scriptures teach concerning the relevant question. It's important that this question be answered first, lest our interpretation of the text be distorted by concordism. In order to determine what those commitments are, I first undertake a detailed genre analysis of Genesis 1 to 11. Right at the start, it became clear to me that the narratives of Adam and Eve must not be interpreted in isolation, but within the context of the primeval history of Genesis 1 to 11, and that primeval history within the context of the entire book of Genesis and the book of Genesis within the context of the Pentateuch. The considerable benefit of such an approach is that it yields a unified solution to the problems posed by the primeval history as a whole, not just to the stories of Adam and Eve. By contrast, the so-called recent genealogical Adam hypothesis, championed by my colleague Michael Murray, neglects context, um, focusing solely on the stories of Adam and Eve, and is not preceded by any genre analysis which is vital to our interpretation of the narratives. I don't want our discussion today to be derailed by debating this alternative model and so I'll say no more about it. The exploration of the question of genre required me to look at the nature or character of myth. The consensus view in classical studies is the folklorist's understanding of myth as a traditional sacred narrative that seeks to anchor present realities in the prehistoric past and so to validate a culture's contemporary institutions and values. In contrast to other form, forms of folklore, such as folk tales and legends, myths are taken to be authoritative for the culture that embraces them. As sacred narratives, their main characters are not usually just human beings, but deities whose activities are set in an earlier age or another realm. Whether one views myth with folklorists as a literary genre of a text, or with John Collins as a social function of a text, is, I think, inconsequential. Either view will lead to the same conclusions. I decided to stick with the consensus view among folklorists rather than with Collins' view 
simply in order to maintain continuity with the folklorist's discussion. Since the lines between myth, folk tale, and legend are apt to be blurry, it is probably impossible to lay down necessary and sufficient conditions for each of these narrative genres. Instead, we ought to be looking for what Ludwig Wittgenstein called family resemblances among stories which are regarded paradigmatically as myths. This is the same approach that Richard Burridge adopted in his groundbreaking work on the genre of the Gospels. On the basis of various family resemblances exhibited by ancient biographies, Burridge was able to show that the Gospels most resemble the genre of ancient biography. Similarly, I drew up a list of 10 family resemblances which folklorists have identified as characteristic of myth and was able to show that Genesis 1 to 11 exhibited eight of the 10 family resemblances. Most importantly, an abundance of etiological motifs grounding realities present to the Pentateuchal author in the primordial past. This provides powerful inductive evidence that genre, uh, the genre of Genesis 1 to 11 is mythical. My invitation to those who disagree is simple. Provide a more plausible explanation of these family resemblances than myth. Hans Madwirme protests this approach to the determination of literary genre. He says the mythical understanding of primeval history is an extra biblical theory that obscures the analogy of faith. Christians should give priority to interpreting scripture in light of scripture. This characterization subtly confuses determining the genre of a biblical book with interpreting a biblical book. There is nothing impious or misguided about looking to extra biblical literature to determine that, say, the Psalms are Hebrew poetry, or that Revelation is apocalyptic, or that the Gospels are ancient biography. The question of interpretation comes later. Similarly, Madueme's charge that my analysis of Genesis 1 to 11 in light of family resemblances among ancient Near Eastern myths presupposes the comparative method is multiply confused. In the first place, these family resemblances compiled by folklorists are not limited to ancient Near Eastern myths, but are collected from myths throughout the world from any time. Second, the comparative method involves comparing pieces of literature with a view towards showing parallels and possible lines of dependency between them. This is a project about which I express enormous skepticism in the book. Madwima also takes umbrage at my claim that Genesis 1 to 11 exhibits fantastic elements, that is, elements which, if taken literally, are so extraordinary as to be palpably false. This is just one of the family resemblances of myth. Madwime doesn't deny that myths are often fantastic, but he denies that my examples from Genesis 1 to 11 are fantastic. He alleges that I'm not determining our biblical commitments independent of modern science after all, because my notion of the fantastic doesn't derive from scripture, but from a mind shaped by modern science. Again, this claim is subtly confused. First of all, the identification of these fantastic elements does not derive from modern science, but has been noted by people as far back as Oregon and Augustine. Second, using scripture itself to determine what is fantastic assumes that scripture does not contain any fantastic elements, which is viciously circular and therefore question begging. Moreover, scripture certainly does contain fantastic elements. Just read the book of Revelation. 
Third, most important, Maduime confuses using modern science to identify fantastic elements in scripture with using modern science to determine our biblical commitments. I reject the latter as concordist. But if, as Maduime seems to think, we are biblically committed to the beliefs that the world is only several thousand years old, that all of the world's languages originated at a Babylonian ziggurat a few thousand years ago, that there has been within the span of human history a worldwide flood that exterminated all terrestrial life on earth, save that aboard the ark, and that every human being who has ever lived on this planet is descended from a single human couple who lived just a few thousand years ago, then I want to be aware of that fact. For that interpretation, uh, if correct, makes the task of reconciling our biblical commitments with the facts of modern science, history, and linguistics hopeless. I don't think that Maguime has any appreciation for just how hopeless such a reconciliation would be. For he remarks, so much the worse for our modern expectations. But the truth is, that such a situation would plausibly call for the sort of drastic revision of the doctrine of inspiration that I describe as the worst case scenarios in my opening chapter. Collins thinks that we can reduce people's resistance to my claim that Genesis 1 to 11 exhibits fantastic elements by characterizing these as pictorial elements. But that's to get ahead of ourselves. How do we know at this point in the inquiry that they are pictorial? I myself will ultimately claim in steps four to six that these elements are pictorial or figurative, but those premises will require argument. I argue that in many cases, the Pentateuchal author did not intend for his narrative to be taken literally. Here, Collins and I are very much on the same page. In my step seven, I proceed to argue that the genre of Genesis 1 to 11 is not pure myth, however. Rather, the genealogies that guide the narratives transform the primeval narratives into a primeval history that melds seamlessly into the patriarchal narratives, which have indisputably a historical interest. Therefore, the best genre analysis of Genesis 1 to 11 involves a blend of myth and history, what has been called mytho-history. Notice that the plausibility of this genre classification for Genesis 1 to 11 in no way depends upon our ability to tease apart which aspects of the story are mythical and which historical. That's not how literary criticism works. I suspect that the blend is more like coffee and cream than a bag filled with colored marbles. With Collins, I think that we can, in some cases, identify elements in the narratives which are plausibly uh, taken to be pictorial or figurative. But identifying some elements as figurative rather than literal is not the same thing as separating myth from history. The whole narrative is mytho-historical and contains figurative language. Having examined the Old Testament data concerning Adam and Eve, I turn next in step nine to the New Testament data. I agree with Medueme that the greatest challenge to my thesis is that neither Jesus nor the apostles apparently interpreted the early chapters of Genesis mytho-historically. But here I argue that appearances can be misleading. If we think that a New Testament author's citation of a text commits us to the historicity of that text, then we're going to find ourselves committed to the historicity of persons and events of Jewish folklore and mythology, 
such as Janus and Jambres, the archangel Michael's dispute with Satan over the body of Moses, and the rolling well that accompanied the Israelites during their wilderness wanderings in the desert. By distinguishing between a literary figure and a historical figure, between using a text illustratively and using a text assertorically, and between what an author believed and what an author taught, we can avoid commitment to such persons and events. It's plausible that many of the passages about Adam in the New Testament commit us to no more than truth in the stories of Genesis, but not all of them. Paul's explanation of the historical consequences of Adam's fall show that he teaches that this event is historical, since the sin of a fictitious person could not have real world consequences outside the fiction. The New Testament witness therefore confirms our biblical commitment to the historicity of Adam and Eve. With step 11, we turn finally to the scientific evidence in order to determine the approximate time at which Adam and Eve existed. In order to do this, we look for manifestations of modern cognitive behaviors. Here, it's important to clear up a confusion on the part of both Murray and Lusco. Lusco represents me as holding that these behaviors make us human. And Murray interprets me to be offering a definition of human. In my view, however, these modern cognitive behaviors are neither definitional nor constitutive of humanity, but rather they serve the paleoanthropologist as evidence of humanity. If you want to see what I think makes us human and defines human, you have to turn to the last chapter of the book where I defend anthropological dualism. A human being is a rational soul united with a hominin body. But since rational souls cannot be detected empirically, we have to look for evidence of rational behavior in order to determine when human beings first appeared on this planet. As a result of my study, I am firmly convinced that Neanderthals exhibited modern cognitive behaviors and therefore were human. Since humanity is unlikely to have evolved twice, it follows that humanity must go back to the most recent common ancestor of Neanderthals and Homo sapiens, namely Homo heidelbergensis, who also exhibited these same modern cognitive behaviors. I was really surprised that Michael Murray, who has so inspired my quest, would question the humanity of Neanderthals. The trend over the last several decades, as described in Rebecca Sykes' new book, Kindred, is quite in the opposite direction. I think, frankly, that Michael's position is out of date and is increasingly difficult to defend. The article that Murray cites to call into question Neanderthal's linguistic abilities supports no such conclusion. The authors push back against the claim that, quote, the substitution at position 114-076-877 in intron 8 of the FOXP2 gene was involved in the evolution of human language. In fact, the authors note that in some African populations, up to 10% of the contemporary population actually carries the ancient allele, not the derived allele. And yet no language impairment has been noticed. A further study published in 2018 found the ancient allele to be present in an even larger fraction of various South African populations, as high as an astonishing 43% in Komani-san, 
uh, which shows that this mutation is not as important for the evolution of speech and language as may have been imagined. I fear that here evangelicals are in danger of dehumanizing fellow human beings. Just as Charles Darwin believed that African blacks are closer on the evolutionary scale to gorillas than to European Caucasians, this would be a morally unconscionable error that we should be zealous to avoid. Now, if the paleontological and archaeological evidence supports the humanity of Neanderthals, then as Step 14 states, Adam and Eve, as the sole universal progenitors of mankind, must have lived before the divergence of Neanderthals and Homo sapiens. The most recent common ancestor of both is often thought to be Homo heidelbergensis, as stated in Step 15. I take to heart Lusko's admonition not to identify Adam and Eve too closely with a particular human species. Rather, as I state on the final page of the book, the name Homo heidelbergensis, quote, serves at least as a useful placeholder for that large-brained human species which was ancestral to Homo sapiens and our various sister species of the human family. We can live with uncertainty, end quote. In step 16, I respond to the challenge posed by population genetics to a single couple origin of the human race. The reason that I did not go into this challenge at greater length is that having been led by the archaeological evidence to the conclusion that Adam and Eve lived some 750,000 years ago, I found that the challenge posed by population genetics simply evaporated. Independent genetic modeling by both Swamidas and Gager and Herster reveal that a single couple origin cannot be ruled out prior to 500,000 years ago. And this fact came to be acknowledged by even the most ardent opponents of a single couple origin, such as Dennis Venema. And so it seemed to me that the hypothesis of an ancient genealogical Adam cannot be ruled out. In her written comments, uh, to which I respond here rather than her oral presentation, Lasko offers significant pushback to this claim. She presses two major objections. First, she disputes my claim that most studies have failed to uncover evidence of trans-species variation between humans and non-human ancestors involving more than four allele lineages, which by implication could have been carried by a heterozygous Adam and Eve. She rejoins, this is only true if you limit your investigation to living species, that is to say to Homo sapiens. But if we include the genomes of extinct human species like Neanderthals, that pushes the date of the last common ancestor further back. She says it turns out that the vast majority of the human nuclear genome coalesces between one million and five million years ago. Now, let's not miss the significance of what is acknowledged here. For years, we have been told that on the basis of the genetic divergence exhibited by the contemporary population, the scientific evidence rules out with heliocentric certainty a single couple origin of the human race. It turns out that that claim is not true. But what about Lusko's revised claim that when we include the genomes of extinct human species, then a single couple origin is ruled out? This revised claim is puzzling for a number of reasons. First, Lusko seems to conflate the argument based on incomplete lineage sorting with the substantially different argument from trans-species variation. The former shows only that the ancestral population leading up to the divergence of chimps and humans, for example, is relatively large. 
But that conclusion is quite consistent with there being a founding pair of humans who were the first to emerge from that ancestral population. In order to rule that out, one needs to prove trans-species variation between that ancestral population and the succeeding human population in excess of four lines of alleles. The claim that the majority of the human nuclear genome coalesces one to five million years ago is in fact entirely consistent with the models that I mentioned before. Both Swamidas and Gager and Herster calculate a time of the most recent common ancestor around two million years ago, but they both arrive at a time of the most recent four alleles of around 500 thousand years ago. Second, the effect of including genetic evidence from extinct human species on the time of the most recent four alleles will indeed push the date further back, but no one knows by how much. In 2017, geneticist Richard Buggs pointed out that the hypothesis of a bottleneck of two had in fact never been tested scientifically. Stephen Schaffner, in his review of my book, observes that since scientists aren't interested in finding such a finding, founding pair, there is scant formal scientific literature on the subject. Flusco's documentation does not support her claim. What the cited passage from David Reich's book basically says is that most of our genealogical ancestors are genetic ghosts. But that's not relevant to our question. I'm not claiming that Adam and Eve's DNA has managed to pass down to us. Reich also quotes the Lee Durbin study, whose shortcomings are already explained in my book. I'd also point out that the HLA complex is unusually susceptible to convergent evolution, which renders the evidence of transspecies variation so uncertain that even Venema would not appeal to it. I know that Swamidas is working on recalculating his results, including ancient DNA, and I'm very eager to see what he comes up with. A complicating factor is that including such genetic information in the models is difficult due to the high amounts of degradation in ancient DNA sequences, as well as to interbreeding between Homo sapiens and extinct species. He anticipates that the time of their most recent four alleles may be pushed back a couple hundred thousand years, which is consonant with my hypothesis. Finally, all this still leaves us uh, wondering about the question of interbreeding between the descendants of Adam and Eve and non-human hominins. My model hopes to minimize the amount of interbreeding, but it doesn't decisively exclude it. Such interbreeding would introduce genetic material into the human race from sources not ultimately traceable to Adam and Eve. So just how much interbreeding does Slusko think would be required in order for the genetic evidence to permit an ancient genealogical Adam and Eve? All this goes to undermine the objection to an ancient genealogical Adam and Eve based on the evidence of population genetics. In her conclusion, Lesko says, I do not agree with Craig that genetic data support humanity deriving from one man and one woman at any point in evolutionary time. But so saying misrepresents my claim. I am not claiming that there is direct genetic evidence for a single couple origin, but rather that a single couple origin is compatible with the scientific evidence. Lusko herself concludes, I also do not think that a lack of direct genetic evidence should make the existence of Adam and Eve any less believable. Exactly, that's my point. But I took her in her written presentation, as opposed to the oral presentation, to be saying that there is direct genetic evidence against the existence of Adam and Eve, and that bold conclusion, I think, has not been proved. 
Flusco's second major objection is that a single couple origin is improbable from the standpoint of genetic health. Time does not permit me to respond to this objection here, but I do respond to it on page 347 of the book. In short, I remain unconvinced that an ancient genealogical Adam and Eve has been shown to be incompatible with the scientific evidence. In conclusion, I resonate strongly with Collins' metaphor of a cost-benefit analysis of the views of the historical Adam. My proposal has the great benefit of allowing us to maintain the traditional doctrine of biblical inspiration and inerrancy. It preserves the traditional doctrines of the universal progenitorship of Adam and Eve and their historical fall into sin. Its genre analysis of the primeval history of Genesis 1 to 11 as a unit uh, enables us to deal with the problems not only of the historical Adam and Eve, but also of the flood, the Tower of Babel, the age of the earth, and so on. It is fully compatible with the accumulating evidence of paleoanthropology that humanity on this planet is very ancient. Its principal cost is that it requires us to give up a recent date of the events of the primeval history, a price that it seems to me is well worth the benefits. Finally, to wrap up the session, we threw the floor open to the audience to ask any question that they wanted of me or the other panelists. This is often the most fun part of the meeting. Uh, I'm Timothy Chen. I direct my question to Dr. Craig. Um, I think Michael tells us that uh, Adam and Eve uh, were created uh, with the uh, image of God. Okay, the image of God really, I would say, contains many things other than the cognitive um, ability or brain size. So, yeah, so this study, Dr. Craig's study, really, really just based on probably knowing science about the brain size or cognitive, cognitive abilities. But if image of God is really more than that, then, uh, then I would say that, you know, I think we have to, the, science, the knowledge from science is limited. We try to correlate with science, but also subject to some limitations there. So your question is? My question is, uh, maybe, I mean, this is, this is not a complete study because we have to know what is really the image of God. In the book, I have a, a fairly good discussion of the question of the image of God, uh, particularly in interaction with Richard Middleton's work. Uh, and I criticize his functional interpretation of the image of God. I think that the image of God consists in some sort of ontological relationship between God and man. So that's defended in the book. But with respect to what you just said, I begin with the assumption that we know that we are human beings. I know you're a human being. You know that I'm a human being. And so we take one another as paradigms of what it is to be human. And then we look for evidences that people like that first existed at some time on Earth. Uh, and so it's not based upon just some sort of a scientific definition, it's based upon a paradigmatic definition uh, that we look for people like us in human history. And I would say that the set of image bearers is coextensive with the set of human beings. They are the same set, unless you include angels as part of the image bearers. God says, let us make man in our image. Is he speaking of the angelic court? If so, then human beings are a subset of the image bearers. Um, <coughs> otherwise, they're, they, they just are the set of image bearers. 
This question is for Dr. Craig and for uh, Jack Collins. I'm quoting your uh, interview with Sean, with, uh, Sean McDowell, and you say the following in your interview with Sean McDowell. Uh, this is really the view that they hold to, and you're referring to Old Testament scholars like Collins. Yes. That the view that they really hold to is a mytho history view, but they don't use the terminology, okay? Because it's so apt to be misunderstood, which has been discussed, okay? But then later you say that this mytho history genre analysis, which you take to be an in depth analysis of which would lead to therefore correct interpretations, that scholars like Collins, quote, they try to conceal the real nature of mytho history by these euphemisms, like worldview story, and so on. Well, I've talked with Collins, and he doesn't think he's concealing anything. <laughs> yeah. And um, he thinks that, so my question for you would be, what did you mean by this? And my question for Collins is, how is it that you're not concealing things by having a multi-dimensional language axis analysis rather than a single dimension genre analysis? So for the sake of recording, he's asking, uh, are you, have you revealed uh, by using the label mytho-history, something that has been going on for quite a while among Old Testament scholars, even though they're not quite willing uh, to use that language. Uh, Dr. Dr. Craig and then Dr. Collins. Yeah. It struck me in reading Old Testament commentators that although some, like Bill Arnold at Asbury, uses the term mytho-history, others, like John Walton, will say imagistic history. Uh, J.I. Packer talked about dramatic history. Um, Gordon Wenham speaks of proto-history. I think John Collins sometimes talks about worldview history, um, but says uh, that he avoids the term myth because of its tremendous potential for misunderstanding. And I, I, at most, I'm guilty here of being uncharitable in saying he's concealing. I apologize, John. Uh, Please ignore that comment. I, I just think that it's important to be straightforward, define our terms clearly, and then use them. But Collins and I are on the same page. He just sees myth as the social function of a narrative as opposed to a genre. And that's fine as far as I'm concerned. Dr. Collins, you have the microphone there to pull over there. Uh, well, uh, I, I'm happy to accept um, Except that, I, 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 for for reasons that, that I've given, I I think that that the designation mytho history, um, I I think I know what it what it's for, um, and the, the difficulties with it are not simply that it will be must misunderstood as important as that is, um, uh, and, and I've uh, e even in in books where I have quoted people who talk about myth. Uh, without automatically condemning them for for using it, then then I get raked over the coals uh, for for I guess for my decency or whatever. But in any case, so so I, ju I just as an empirical fact, I know that that it will be un misunderstood. But but I th I think further, it uh, I I think if we start unfolding these these things of uh, in a multi-dimensional way, I I think we'll probably get closer to, to what Genesis is aiming to do. Uh, Wenham uses the term proto-history, um, and I think that's helpful. Um, and and I, I suppose it becomes, you know, uh, warring Assyriologists, you know, Jacobson on the, one, on the one side, and then Wenham and I going with uh, William Hallow on the other side with the prehistory and proto-history. Um, where, where, where we are finding our commonality is that we're going outside the discipline of people in biblical studies to, to people who are simply historians because we're hoping that that's less tendentious language. And, that, and that's what we're looking for, is something that, that is less tendentious, less weighted with um, you know, dangerous you know, liberalizing tendencies and so forth. Um, so it, it, it becomes then a choice of which Assyriologist we, we find most helpful. Question right here, and then next we'll get in the back. You go ahead and ask your question, sir. My question's for Dr. Lusco. Uh, we've used the term single pair interchangeably with Adam and Eve today. Even if we escape the clutches of the difficulties of a single pair genetically, how do we not hourglass into that same difficulty with the Noahic flood? And how have you dealt with that so that we don't have a Noahic chin? 
<laughs> so, Dr. Lusko, what have you do done with the flood of Noah? Okay, so this is my first, sorry, can you hear me okay? Yeah. This is my first uh, foray into this really fascinating interdisciplinary realm. So I actually have not given any thought to, to the flood, but I but thank you for the question. <laughs> I'll think about it. Question in the back, sir. Yes, you. Yeah, this is for uh, Dr. Craig. Dr. Craig. <laughs> Craig. <laughs> Craig Kogel. Uh, Bill, you seem to be proceeding in this whole assessment as if the uh, neo-Darwinian synthesis in some broad sense is actually sound, and therefore you're trying to demonstrate that your analysis uh, is, is consistent with that, that scientific assessment if someone believes it. But it also seems like you're, and I understand, trying to follow the nice edge here without going on either side of the issue, just saying your analysis shows a compatibility there. And I'm just wondering if you're feeling, if you feel comfortable um, letting us know whether or not you personally are a theistic evolutionist or not. So to repeat the question, Dr. Craig, uh, you've, you are presenting the evidence as being compatible with the current consensus of science in the evolutionary paradigm. Uh, the, the, the question is, is this actually your personal view? Greg, uh, this is presented as a hypothesis to show that there's no incompatibility between contemporary evolutionary science and a single couple origin. But it's perfectly consistent with Adam and Eve being created out of the dust of the earth and Adam's rib. Um, I'm inclined with Collins to think that these are pictorial or metaphorical. Um, but I, I don't take a sort of firm stand on that. That just goes beyond the aspirations of this project. Yeah, uh, Dr. Craig, does your view either require or heavily lean towards a particular view of a soul with respect to something like the creationist or producing view? So the question is, does your, your, your position lean towards a creationist or traditionist or any particular view of the soul? I suppose for the soul of Adam and Eve, it would be a, a creationist view because they couldn't get it from their non-human parents. So it would seem that their God would infuse into apparent hominins rational souls at the same time that he creates a regulatory genetic mutation that increases the capacity of their brain and central nervous system to be the seat of a rational soul. How that works out with their descendants, I, I don't think it makes a commitment. Uh, yeah, this is for Dr. Craig and Dr. Collins uh, to weigh in on, but it's kind of a two-parter. Do you distinguish between phenomenological details in the Genesis account and fantastic elements? And if so, like Dr. Collins, you and, and others have pointed out that the Israelites themselves um, wouldn't have taken literally certain things like solid dome and things like that because they understood that rain comes from clouds and things like that. So would you see there being other biblical indications throughout the Old Testament that would show us that the Israelites wouldn't have taken things like a talking snake or those details um, literally like that? Do you distinguish between phenomenological language and fantastical language, uh, particularly in Genesis and in the biblical account for you and then also for Dr. Collins? I have a really interesting discussion of phenomenological language in the early part of the book in response to the claim of Dennis Lamour that for ancient people, they had no way of distinguishing between the way things appear to us and the way things really are. So that for them, phenomenological meant ontological or real. And I think I just explode that uh, viewpoint. First, uh, I point out that ancients would have been familiar, for example, with the idea of things diminishing in size as they recede into the distance. They would see the caravan shrinking as it goes off into the desert, and they would know that that's not real, that's merely phenomenal, because they themselves have been on such caravans. Uh, and then I gave this great quotation from this Mesopotamian myth called the Etana story where an angel takes Etana, or not an angel, an eagle takes Etana up to heaven. And as he rises in the sky, 
Babylon shrinks and gets smaller and smaller, and the great sea turns into a little pond and then hardly a, a puddle. And Etana says, take me back, take me back. I can't stand it. They clearly understood this difference between phenomenal and ontological. The second illustration that, uh, that Lamukur isn't aware of is that Babylonian astronomy was anti-realist. It was purely instrumentalist. They had no physical cosmology. And so these statements about the cosmic dome and the heavens and stuff like that, it's all just metaphorical or pictorial language. And we know this because the Babylonian astronomers were only interested in making astral predictions when the stars, the planets, the suns would be in these same positions year by year. And to calculate this, they had two incompatible models for making these calculations. They couldn't both be true, and yet empirically, they yielded the same results. And so either one was good. And so historians of science have shown that ancient Babylonian science was anti-realist. So I think this just completely refutes this claim that the ancients didn't understand the difference between phenomenological language and, and, um, and real descriptions. Dr. Collins, it, it, it was also addressed to you. Do you want to add anything, or you just want to say ditto? Or? Uh, carry on. I, I don't really have much. To, I mean, I, I could add a lot to that, but I, I, I shan't. Okay. All right. Yes. Uh, right there, and then we'll get you next. Right there, sir. And this is a question about Dr. Lesko. Dr. Lesko. Uh, the, the mutation rate within DNA, I uh, assume that it's constant over time. I would think a test of that is across the DNA, does the mutation rate vary for one part of the DNA to the other, or is it the same throughout the whole DNA? Did you get it? You, do you want to read it for the oh, or, Okay, the question is, do you want me to do the question? Yes, okay, would you question? do that? <laughs> <laughs> I've actually been having the same thought. I'm like, really glad you're interpreting the questions because I don't know the language very well. So the question is about mutation rates, and is it constant no matter where you're looking at in terms of the genome? Um, so we know that it varies. So it's very high in mitochondrial DNA because it's outside the protective nucleus. It is much lower within the nuclear DNA, but then it depends on where, um, where, the, the, where on the chromosome you're looking at. Um, so there are hot spots of mutation, and there are some regions that are just more prone to being mutated than, than other regions. So th this is another reason why every region of a chromosome has a different evolutionary history. Yes, uh, I think you do it. Yeah, for Dr. Um, and for Dr. Craig, um, you know, as a uh, PhD student, a lot of my traditional background has been challenged. Um, uh, but this question, um, Dr. Madume challenged based uh, on an apostolic tradition and, and based on you know the, the uses of Genesis within the New Testament. So theologically, then, based on Christian obligations and duties, for many of us in this room, um, can such a view of Adam and Eve as the direct creation of God be harmonized with what, what you just presented on. So, so is, yeah, I think you, it is what you presented compatible with the idea of de novo creation of Adam and Eve. Am I asking that question correctly? Uh, so the question seems to be just about Dr. Craig's view and, and whether it's compatible with, yeah, de novo uh, creation of Adam and Eve. Um, I, I'm not sure. I, 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 I'm not sure he uh, addressed that at length. But even in your comments today, I think uh, potentially it's compatible with de novo creation, but um, of Adam and Eve. But if you were going to expand, if, if that's all you mean by de novo creation, that's one thing. But if by de novo creation we include that all human beings are descended from Adam and Eve, and that um, Adam and Eve were the sole progenitors, and there weren't any other human or human-like beings outside the garden. So if you, if you sort of give a, a thicker understanding of de novo creation, then I'm not sure that uh, Dr. Craig's view would be compatible with that. But if you had a narrow construal, maybe so. But I'll let Bill address that. Yeah, of course it is compatible with that. If you want to have de novo <laughs> creation, that's fine. And the whole point of my model, the ancient genealogical Adam, 
In contrast to Swami Das's recent genealogical atom is I don't want any people outside the garden. I think that it is a theological um, priority to maintain the universal progenitorship of Adam and Eve and not to compromise that just to get them recent. I don't frankly understand why people would regard recency as more important than universal progenitorship. Amen. Gavin, who's your, your, your direction for your question? Yes, for Dr. Craig, I thank all of you. Um, Genesis 4 references farming, and then a bit later, it references building of cities and musical instruments. These are things we see more recently in, in human culture. How would you reconcile that with the more ancient date for Adam? So the question is, Genesis 4 shows a lot of Neolithic activities, farming, cities, musical instruments, etc. And uh, so that would seem to fit better with a relatively recent timeline. How does that fit with your model? Here I agree with John Collins that these are anachronisms in the uh, narrative. They're projections of the contemporary Pentateuchal authors society. Keep in mind, this little mytho-history that Genesis 1 to 11 describes is less than 2,000 years long when you add up the ages of the antediluvians and post-diluvians. Even by ancient standards, as John indicated, uh, this is tiny compared to the hundreds of thousands of years that they thought kings reigned in Sumer and, and ancient Babylon, or, or the thousands of years in Egypt. So these are, I would say, simply um, anachronisms that are not meant to be taken as historically literal because it's narrating this little tiny weeny mytho history less than 2,000 years long. All right, uh, that deals with the other end of the theological spectrum. The scripture seems to show us, based on Jesus' post-resurrection body, that our resurrected bodies will have enough physical continuity with our earthly bodies to Given the book's conclusion that humans include different developmental species or subspecies, should we expect to be distinct glorified species? This is a question that really bothered me and that I address in the last chapter. We don't want the saints in heaven to look at these Neanderthal brethren that are there with them in the eschaton and be repulsed by them because of their hideous appearance. Adam and Eve are not ape men, right? And one of the things that was so, uh, uh, was such a relief to me, frankly, was to discover how modern Homo Heidelbergensis looks. Uh, when my wife Jan saw the painting on the cover of the book, she says, he's really a handsome dude, isn't he? <laughs> uh, and one of the other ancient sister species, Homo antecessor, had a very modern face, uh, and these were found in Spain, these fossils. So um, the, the appearance of Neanderthals may have been largely derived characteristics, uh, perhaps due to living in Ice Age climates and things of that sort. So uh, I think we're going to be really glad to see some of these brethren in the eschaton. And when we see them, we'll recognize them and we'll say, wow, you were there near the beginning, weren't you? Tell me, what, what was it like? What was it like then? Uh, so I, I, th I think we'll see some of them. This is for Dr. Lusco. Dr. Lusco. The question, you made an argument that it's very unlikely that any genetic information would reach people today. And you used a graph, a pictorial graph, labeled ancestor genetic contribution to your genome. However, Prior to that, you showed a slide that showed us that our ancestors, as we go back in time, increase until the number reaches, exponentially until the number reaches, more than the number of people who ever existed. So it seems to me that you have to have a kind of coalescence so that 30 generations before on my mother's grandfather, um, and on my 30 generations before my father's grandfather are actually the same person. And so this tree that branches out, branches back in simply because of the limitations of the population on the planet at the time. So it seems to me that um, you actually could 
still have the genetic information with a kind of a, co a reverse coalescence coming back down to today, and so that we would, because that pattern you showed shows it all scattered, but certainly each of those um, alleles, I guess they are, at the ends, could converge into a single primal person and, and not be scattered to nothing. I'm gonna let you repeat the question. Yeah, it's a, <laughs> it's a beautiful question, and it's about um, if you have, uh, Basically, you have more genealogical ancestors than, um, than actually existed on Earth. Doesn't that mean that there's this imbrication of inheritance? And could that imbrica imbrication actually just go through two people? Did I give you fair justice on that? Yes. OK. Um, and this is a fantastic question. And this is where uh, that imbrication is actually how population biologists understand how evolution works, that you it's not about individuals. Individuals are just these, these really fleeting moments in time and that things are happening through time and that you have, because of the reshuffling of recombination, you have just different recombinations of, of gene variants over, over time. Um, and that's why the, the number of individuals to have a population is so important as a population geneticist. And this is where you then get to that second point I made where if you only have two individuals, you just don't have enough genetic variation based on our understanding of the way biology works to be a healthy society, a healthy population. So if you look at like endangered animals, you know, once they get down to like 100 individuals, they're fundamentally extinct. Um, and so this is where assuming that the biological processes today were the same that were applied then, it wouldn't be a viable uh, model. But, but you're not looking for a scientific explanation. You know, you're looking for a possibility of some very unique event having happened. And I think this is where there can be a disconnect in the language that makes it seem like I'm flat out rejecting an Adam and Eve when it's really just the scientific evidence doesn't support that, but you're not looking for it as a scientific evidence. It, we have run out of time, and I want to thank the panelists uh, for their contributions. Would you join me? Mm -hmm.